Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The First Minister and all MSPs will have read further stories this week of women in Scotland dying from breast cancer, unable to receive the drug Progetta, a life-extending drug available to patients elsewhere in the UK. There will be women this week and in the weeks to come who will hear the devastating news that they have HER2 positive secondary breast cancer. Because Progetta is a first-line treatment, they need to get it quickly to benefit from that additional time to live. What would the First Minister advise them to do? First Minister. Well, firstly, there will not be a single family in Scotland that has not been touched in some way uh, by cancer, including, of course, breast cancer. Uh, all of us know that being diagnosed with cancer is an incredibly difficult time uh, for patients, but for all of their families and friends. Uh, and one of the things that is very important is that patients get speedy access to appropriate treatment and where that appropriate treatment is considered to be drugs, then that includes drugs. However, as I have said many times in this parliament, and I think this is something that is appreciated uh, by members across the chamber, the decisions around the approval of drugs in Scotland are not taken by ministers. They are rightly, in my view, taken independently of ministers in parliament by the Scottish Medicines Consortium. Those decisions uh, are based on clinical and indeed cost effectiveness. Uh, in terms of the uh, Progetta uh, drug that Ruth Davidson uh, has uh, highlighted today, uh, national procurement officials, NHS national procurement officials, are currently engaging uh, with the pharmaceutical company that manufactures it, Roche, uh, to explore how they can offer that drug at both a fair and a transparent price. Uh, those discussions uh, are building on discussions that took place between the company and Scottish Government officials uh, last week, uh, I believe. And my message to the company today would be to encourage uh, them to resubmit Progetta to the SMC at a transparent price and allow the SMC to do its independent job. It will always be a source of concern uh, where particular drugs that patients feel will be of benefit to them uh, are not approved, even if that is just for a short period of time. Of course, there are some drugs that are approved in Scotland that will not be approved in other parts of the UK and vice versa. These are always difficult issues, but perhaps because they are so difficult, it's important that we do respect the independent processes in place. I thank Ruth the First Davidson. Minister for that answer. The fact is that if women in Scotland lived just a few miles south of the border, they wouldn't have to think about moving house or uprooting their family to have access to a medicine that keeps them alive. We know that a deal was done between the NHS in both England and Wales and with Progetta's manufacturer. And the First Minister told us two weeks ago and has reminded us again just a moment ago that the drug company are in discussions with NHS Scotland. And she also made the point that the Scottish Medicines Consortium makes decisions independently of government. But can she at least say today that if the same deal is offered to Scotland as was offered and accepted to England and Wales, will it be accepted here? First Minister. Well, I would, I would certainly hope that is the case, but of course that is a decision for the Scottish Medicines Consortium. I, I don't have access to all the details of what the deal uh, is. I, I don't know if this is the case uh, with this particular drug, but often those deals are commercially confidential. Um, this is a, an important issue. It's a very serious issue. I, I do think, though, uh, some of the way in which Ruth Davidson has characterised that is not entirely fair. Uh, for example, I, I could point to another drug uh, for treatment of advanced breast cancer, which is available and approved in Scotland, but is not currently approved in England. There are other drugs that will fall into the same category. So it's sometimes, I think, too easy to characterise these decisions in that way. Uh, sometimes these situations arise precisely because we have our own processes in place. Uh, England goes through a different process through NICE. We have the Scottish Medicines Consortium, and I think that is a process that is widely backed by people across this chamber. So these are difficult decisions, and it's right that we support the SMC to take these decisions. And I would, and if uh, what Ruth Davidson is encouraging the company to do is make sure that the price that has been offered to NHS Scotland is as reasonable, fair and transparent as the price that's been offered elsewhere in the UK, then I would certainly endorse that. And hopefully the discussions that are underway will lead to exactly that. Ruth Davidson. Um, I do understand that the SMC makes the decisions independently of government, but I would also gently remind the Chamber that the government sets the framework under which these decisions are made. And because of a cancer drugs fund in England, Progetta has been available down south for more than four years. Years and it has had an effect. If we take an example, Bonnie Fox's son 
was just four months old when she was diagnosed with secondary breast cancer in 2015. Because she lives in London, she can receive Progetta and is still alive to see her son's third birthday. But for years, women in Scotland have been missing out on this treatment. This drug has gone back and forth to the SMC for a decision three times since 2013. Can the First Minister honestly say that the system her government has overseen for all these years has done its best by these women? First Minister. It, 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 if I was talking about another drug uh, in England, uh, I guess the same arguments could be made yeah. in reverse. These are the outcomes of independent processes. It's uh, not because uh, there is a refusal to, to fund that is unreasonable. It's about making sure that the company submits a fair price. Because if we don't insist on companies submitting fair prices, then there are fewer drugs that we are able to make available for patients. That's why these processes are so important. Now, Ruth Davidson rightly says it's the government that sets the framework. That's why I'm sure she's aware of the significant reforms that have been introduced in recent years. For example, between 2011 and 2013, the combined SMC acceptance rate for orphan and cancer medicines was just 48%. But because of the reforms we've introduced between 2014 and 2016, SMC uh, approval of ultra-orphan, orphan and end-of-life medicines is now 75%. So these reforms uh, are leading to improvements. But that doesn't remove the need for very close consideration of individual applications. I, I want to see as many medicines and drugs approved and available to patients as possible. But we would not be doing a service to patients if we did not have a robust independent process in place. It's right that we do so and all of us should support it. Of course, that responsibility uh, is particularly important for the Scottish Government, which is why we've been having the discussions that I've spoken about and why we are encouraging the company to resubmit at that fair and transparent price that will allow it to be approved. Ruth Davidson. In Scotland today, women with secondary breast cancer are faced with a choice. They can move home for a chance to live longer, or they can stay put in the knowledge that that chance is denied them here. We urgently need a deal on Progetta, and we need to fix the system now. The Health Secretary promised a new system of negotiating on the cost of medicines in December 2016. At the time, Mary Allison, the Scottish Director of Breast Cancer Now, said, we need to deliver these changes quickly and effectively. There is no time to lose. It is now May 2018, 17 months later. So what is taking this government so long to fix the system to help women get access to medicines like Progetta? And can the First Minister give the exact date that her government will put in place the new negotiating system that she promised so that we have greater access to treatments that let people live longer and better quality lives? First Minister. The, the Montgomery review uh, that was asked by this government, by this health secretary, uh, to recommend reforms. There is an ongoing process of implementing those reforms. It's partly because of the reforms we have implemented that the figures that I read out earlier on have been achieved. There is further work being led uh, by National Services Scotland uh, right now. Uh, and it is important that we continue to reform a system, as I'm sure will be the case in other parts of the UK, to make sure it operates as well as it possibly can. But I think this is the important point. No matter how good and efficient the system is, that doesn't remove the need for individual decisions to be taken on individual drugs. There is a process underway about Progetta. I hope that process concludes uh, positively as quickly as possible. But part of the responsibility there is for the drug company uh, to come forward with a fair and transparent price for the drug. And I hope one thing we can agree on today is the encouragement to the drug company to do exactly that. I don't think it's fair uh, to, uh, as I say, characterise it in the way that Ruth Davidson partly has today, because equally we could do that with other drugs in reverse. Uh, we have systems in place. Uh, these are difficult decisions. Uh, I'm sure that the Health Secretary will identify with what I'm about to say. When I was Health Secretary, these were amongst the most difficult decisions you ever confront. Uh, but the most important thing as a Health Secretary, and now as a First Minister, is to have confidence in the processes we have in place. I do have confidence in those processes. Of course, they are always open to improvement, uh, but we must make sure those processes are independent to get the right results and the fair results for all patients across the country, and that's what we are determined to do. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, 
How many families will be hit by the 57% hike in childcare charges proposed by Glasgow City Council? First Minister. Well, of course, the decisions that Glasgow City Council have taken, and they are decisions for Glasgow City Council, also involved, as I'm sure Richard Leonard uh, will be aware of, extending, I believe, beyond the national recommended provision, the number of free hours for families, as I understand it, uh, earning less than £30,000. Uh, so uh, they have been uh, working hard to accelerate the progress towards the doubling of uh, free provision uh, and doing that in a way that targets those at the bottom end of the income scale. And of course, uh, we are committed nationally and in the last uh, couple of weeks we've agreed a deal with COSLA about the funding of our transformation of early years education and childcare. Um, and that's something I hope people across the chamber would welcome. Richard Leonard. First Minister, the question I asked was how many families in Glasgow will be affected by the SNP's decision to hike up childcare charges? And the answer, according to a Freedom of Information disclosure, is 5,000. 5,000 families already struggling with the cost of living. 5,000 families like the Spence family. Sarah Spence works for the NHS as an assistant practice manager in Anderson. It is a vital job, but she told me, I feel like I will be forced to give up work to look after my son, which is unfair, as I love my job in the NHS, and I do not want to not work. Today, the childcare costs for her 18-month-old son, Ollie, are £420 a month. With these proposed increases, the family would have to find another £220 a month. First Minister, how many working class families do you know with a spare £220 a month? First Minister. Well, I've got many, many constituents uh, in my constituency in Glasgow who, of course, benefit from the free uh, childcare that Glasgow City Council uh, makes available. As I said, Glasgow City Council have made a number of changes to their provision, including increasing uh, the numbers of hours that are provided free to families, as I understand it, uh, earning under £30,000. But of course, the reason why we are working so hard and investing so considerably to increase the provision of childcare is to reduce the costs overall for families, not just families in Glasgow, but families across the country. Uh, the reforms that we are currently in the process of implementing with local authority colleagues will save families across the country thousands of pounds a year, as well as giving young people the best start in life. That, I think, is a direction of travel that all of us across this chamber should warmly welcome. Richard Leonard. First Minister, at your party's conference just last October in Glasgow, you said, and I quote, some parents still face a struggle to find and fund the childcare they need to allow them to work. We are going to change that. So how does a 57% hike in childcare charges change that struggle for working families for the better? It doesn't, does it? It changes it for the worse. First Minister, this won't allow people to work. It will slam the door on work for people. So will you listen to what 5,000 families across the city of Glasgow are telling you? Will you add your voice to their demand? First Minister, Will you stick to your word? Will you stand up for these families? And will you stand up against these outrageous increases? First Minister. Well, it's because I believe so strongly what I said in the speech that's just been quoted by Richard Leonard, that by the end of this parliament, this government with our partners in local authorities will be investing almost in total £1 billion, doubling the amount of free childcare that is available to families across this country. At doing something that Labour never did in all the years that they were in power. So we'll get on, we'll get on with the job of providing the money to local authorities to allow them to double their provision of free childcare, something that will be of benefit to children and to families the length and breadth of this country. Can I remind members that they should always speak through the chair. Uh, constituency question, Liam Kerr. 
Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Uh, First Minister, on Tuesday this week, the Press and Journal reported that hoax calls to Aberdeen firefighters are at a five-year high, which ties up vital resources and puts the lives of our brave firefighters and members of the public at risk. So what steps will the government take to crack down on hoax 999 calls? And given that many of these calls are from those struggling with mental health difficulties, isn't this another case where local, joined-up approach from multiple services will succeed over top-down centralisation? First Minister. Well, firstly, my uh, strong and unequivocal message to anybody making a hoax call to one of our emergency services is don't do it because it ties up resources uh, that those in need are, are depending on. Um, in terms of the uh, broader part of the question about mental health, I, I do have a, a great deal of sympathy with that, which is why, of course, uh, we're investing in mental health workers in uh, non-health settings, particularly in criminal justice uh, settings, which I think was something I uh, also uh, announced recently uh, in perhaps the same speech that Richard Leonard has just quoted. So these are important issues in terms of the provision of mental health support, but of course uh, not everybody who will make a hoax call is in that position, and I think all of us have a duty uh, to remind people of how precious our emergency services are, uh, how reliant all of us are at times on them, and how all of us have a duty to treat them with the utmost respect. Constituency question, Andy Whiteman. Uh, last Thursday, uh, the First Minister will be aware that 25-year-old Shabazz Ali, a Syrian refugee, was stabbed six times in Edinburgh, is now critically in the hospital. He had been at the time trying to protect his young female cousin when he was attacked at hostel in the city. Can I ask the First Minister what support the Scottish Government and its agencies are giving to local authorities and communities in Edinburgh and across Scotland in terms of protection and reassurance? following what appears to be a clear racially motivated criminal act. First Minister. Uh, well, uh, thank you to Andy Whiteman for raising uh, this issue. I, of course, am aware of the case of Shabas Ali, who was attacked and seriously hurt in the early hours of Thursday morning last week. Clearly, there is a, a criminal investigation underway into this incident, and as we're not aware of the full circumstances of the case as yet, uh, we and I am uh, obviously restricted in what we can say about this specific case. What I will say more generally, though, is this. Scotland must stand united at all times against all forms of racism and all types of hate crime. Uh, we want Scotland to be, uh, and to be seen to be, a refuge from war and persecution, and any attack on any individual or group of people living in Scotland, regardless of who they are or, or where they come from, it should be seen as an attack on all of us. And the Scottish Government will do uh, what we can with the local authority in Edinburgh and with other groups to provide as much reassurance and support as possible. I am aware there is a, a fundraising campaign to raise uh, funds for this particular individual, and I'm sure uh, many people across the country will want to support that. Constituency question, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Police are battling a significant rise in the amount of crack cocaine flooding streets in my region and particularly in Fife. Officers have found drugs have become much more available over the last six months, promoting a fear of an epidemic. The Scottish Government's drug strategy is clearly failing the residents of Fife. Can I ask the First Minister what future robust measures will be put in place to combat this issue as a matter of urgency? Yeah. First Minister. Well, we will continue to support uh, our police in the vital job they do to get drugs off of our streets and our police work hard uh, every single day of every week in doing exactly that. We are never and never will be complacent about the, the risk and the threat and the impact of drugs but in terms of the reference to uh, the Scottish Government's drug strategy uh, I would uh, disagree with that. Uh, latest figures indeed indicate that the number of adults uh, who reported drug use actually decreased uh, from 7.6% in uh, 2008, 9 to 6% in 2014-15 and the latest survey of drug taking behaviour amongst young people uh, shows that the majority uh, of young people 13 and 15 year olds have never uh, used drugs uh, so we've got to be aware of that context while of course continuing to treat uh, drug use as seriously as we do. Constituency question Adam Tompkins. Um, thank you Deputy Presiding Officer. On this topic actually what is the First Minister's reaction to news this week that in Glasgow cocaine can be delivered more quickly than pizza? First Minister. Well, obviously I am concerned at what has been reported in terms of cocaine uh, use. Uh, that is something that should concern all of us. And as I said in relation uh, to the previous question, we are never and never will be complacent about that. But we must put 
uh, these issues in the context that I just did in terms of the declining uh, use of drugs amongst the adult population. Uh, we are also uh, giving additional resources to improve the provision and quality of services for people with substance misuse issues. Uh, and while it's uh, not exactly uh, relevant to the cocaine issue that uh, Adam Tompkins has raised, of course, one of the things that we support and I know Glasgow City Council supports, and I think indeed this whole parliament supported a couple of weeks ago, is a safe consumption facility in Glasgow because we need to look at different, uh, different ways of dealing with uh, the drug issue and we are certainly uh, open to doing exactly that. Constituency question, Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the First Minister share my concerns that the Tory-led Scottish Borders Council is reducing its share of funding for the bus service X101102, withdrawing its contribution of just over 135,000 to a measly 35,000, affecting many of my constituents in places such as West Linton and Pennycook? Does the First Minister agree with me that flies in the face of encouraging public transport? And will she raise this with the Transport Minister? First Minister. Well, as I, I said uh, earlier in response to another question on another issue, these are, are matters for the local uh, council. Uh, but I can well understand that the situation that Christine Graham has outlined will be of concern to people in her uh, constituency. I'm sure the Transport Minister would be happy to discuss it further uh, with her and uh, I'm sure she will take him up on that opportunity. Question number three, Willie Rennie. I want to ask the First Minister about Brexit. The Conservative Foreign Secretary says his Prime Minister's plan is crazy. Labour members of Parliament are in open revolt. Two years on from the referendum, Brexit is a shambles and it's damaging the country. The First Minister's trusted former advisor, Noel Dolan, says that it's time for her to back a referendum on the Brexit deal. He is right, isn't he? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, I can just say I'm going to take the opportunity to tease Noel Dolan uh, mercilessly that after so many years being my advisor, uh, helping me with FMQs in opposition and in government, he managed to avoid being the story and then not long after his retirement, he manages uh, to do the, the opposite. Um, on the serious issue though, I'd say this to, to Willie Rennie in all sincerity, it's not the SNP that's going to be a block uh, if there is to be a second referendum on the EU issue. I think if there's to be any prospect of that, it's not the SNP he needs to convince. It's one of the main parties in Westminster that he will need to convince. And given that uh, we can, at the moment, seem to even convince uh, the Labour uh, opposition at Westminster of the case for the single market, I'm not sure uh, there's much grounds for optimism. But I would suggest his target on this is, is the wrong one. The second point I would make, and it's, it's quite an important point, is that, and I understand this, uh, the motivation for people arguing for another EU referendum is that they hope uh, the result would be different from the one the last time. That, that's not really relevant in Scotland because in the EU referendum, Scotland did vote to remain. Yeah. The problem in Scotland is that our remain vote has been completely ignored. So what guarantees can Willie Rennie give people in Scotland that if that was the outcome again, our remain vote it wouldn't be ignored in exactly the same way all over again? Willie Rennie. <laughs> The, the problem for the First Minister is that time is running out. We could be leaving within months. She has told us, she has told us before that she is sympathetic to this. She's sympathetic to a referendum on the Brexit deal. But if she is so sympathetic, why doesn't she just pick it up? Because Noel Dolan wasn't alone in speaking up for a Brexit deal referendum. Another former advisor, Kevin Pringle, agreed. Two of the great thinkers in the <laughs> SNP. First Minister. Oh, sorry, Mr Rennie, I thought you were finished. I'm terribly sorry. Carry on. And Keith Brown has a degree of sympathy for the idea as well. <laughs> he... oh, And Ian Blackford, Ian Blackford, <laughs> he's open to looking at it as well. So with the backing of so many people in her party and the damage that Brexit is doing to the country, is the First Minister prepared finally to make a decision to put her government behind a public vote to back 
a vote on the Brexit deal. First Minister. Well, can I first... Oh, sorry, I thought I finished there. I was enjoying that so much. Um, can I firstly thank uh, Willie Rennie for his warm words of praise for so many of my SNP colleagues. Can I remind him that all of these great thinkers, and I agree with them that they are all great thinkers, all support Scottish independence. Yay! So hopefully, hopefully they'll be persuasive with Willie Rennie on, on that issue as well. Can I... Oh, um, Joanne. Uh, 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 indeed, I, I, indeed, I'll concentrate on Willie Rennie for the moment. I think... Um, I would say this in all seriousness to Willie Rennie. The, the SNP is not a block to this, but equally, the SNP is not capable of bringing about a second referendum uh, on the EU position. Willie Rennie would be better spending his time trying to persuade uh, Labour of that, yeah. as hopefully yeah. together we can all spend our time trying to persuade Labour of the case for the single market and the customs union. So I agree with Willie Rennie and his characterisation of Brexit is a complete and utter shambles and I hope common sense breaks out in a number of ways but I think Willie Rennie uh, would be better to spend his time uh, trying to persuade uh, those who could uh, make a, a, a bigger uh, difference here uh, and I will leave the great thinkers of my party to persuade him and a whole host of other things as well. Yeah. <laughs> Further supplementary, Maurice Corey. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. 100 years ago today, uh, this year, the people of Isla witnessed the tragedies of the sinking of HMS Otranto and SS Tuscania off the coast of Isla, resulting in a huge loss of American servicemen en route to support the Allied forces' effort in Europe in World War I. Would the First Minister join me in thanking the people of Isla and the World War I Commemoration Committee of Isla and for the very moving service of commemoration at the War Memorial in Port Ellen and other commemorative events on Friday last week held in the presence of Her, Mad of Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal and Admiral Sir uh, Timothy Lawrence and senior representatives from the UK government, the Scottish government and senior diplomats from the United States of America, France and Germany. First Minister. Uh, yeah, yes, I will. I, I was very sorry personally not to be able to uh, be in Isla on Friday of last week due to uh, the funeral of, of a personal friend in Glasgow that I uh, had to attend, but it, it was a tremendous uh, ceremony and the commemorations, and I would uh, take the opportunity to thank the World War I Commemoration uh, Committee, not just for their work around uh, the Isla commemoration, but all of the work that be, they've been doing to commemorate uh, the, the battles and key events of World War I. But it was an opportunity, uh, I think, to pay tribute to the spirit and generosity of the people of Isla and, of course, the uh, American uh, service uh, men that benefited from uh, that generosity. So I would thoroughly endorse uh, all of the comments that have just been made. Further supplementary, Anna Sarwar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, I, I listened carefully to the exchanges between the First Minister and Ruth Davison around the breast cancer drug Progetta. Um, as we know in the Montgomery Review of the SMC, one of the recommendations that we won on these benches was for an interim accepted period. That was to allow for life-prolonging medicines to be made available while the SMC and the medicines company negotiated a price. Why has that not been implemented because surely that is the answer to give these life-prolonging drugs to these breast cancer patients. First Minister. Well, of course, drugs can already be made available on an exceptional basis through uh, individual patient treatment uh, processes, and that's an important part of the process we have in place. As I've already said, we are introducing on an ongoing basis the recommendations of the Montgomery Review. Some of them require very careful consideration and I uh, hope that Anna Sarwa and others would accept the need for that and we will continue to take forward these reforms to ensure that patients do get uh, the fair access to drugs and medicines that all of us want to see. Further supplementary, Alex Cole-Hamilton. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. On Tuesday, a young doctor in my constituency contacted me to say that 10 days ago, after a gruelling recruitment process, she'd been awarded a place that would see her become a consultant in her desired field of medicine. On Friday, a week after making plans with her partner to move house, she received the devastating news that due to an administrative error, all offers were being withdrawn. All told, this has affected over 100 doctors in Scotland, some of whom had bought houses and resigned positions on the strength of these offer, uh, offers. Does the First Minister support calls for an inquiry into this matter? And will her government consider offering some form of compensation to those doctors in Scotland financially disadvantaged by this mistake. First Minister. 
Well, firstly, as Alec Cole Hamilton will no doubt be aware, this is a, a UK-wide issue that has arisen and is affecting doctors, not just in Scotland, but in other parts of the UK. Of course, we are paying very close attention to that and will consider uh, the particular points that Alec Cole Hamilton uh, has made. If the doctor in his constituency uh, wishes to, uh, I'm sure the health secretary would be happy to correspond uh, with them directly in order to see what advice and help can be offered. And I'll ask the health secretary to correspond more generally uh, with Alec Cole Hamilton about the action that the Scottish Government uh, will be looking to take to make sure, firstly, that this situation is rectified and, secondly, uh, that it can't happen again in future. Uh, a quick further supplementary, please, from Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, this morning, BT announced that it will cut thousands of jobs in back office and middle management whilst creating additional jobs to support network deployment and customer service. Can she advise the Chamber what the implications of the decision are for Scotland? First Minister. Well, I am aware of the announcement made by BT this morning. As of yet, uh, we have had no indication from BT on exactly how this will affect uh, their Scottish operations. We will be seeking further information from uh, BT over uh, the next couple of days, and we will, in an appropriate way, share that, of course, with members who have an interest in this. Uh, obviously, this will be a concerning time uh, for the company's employees who may be affected uh, by this decision, uh, and Scottish Government officials have already contacted uh, BT Scotland to offer guidance and see whether we can provide any assistance. But as we have further information, uh, we will share that uh, with Parliament. Question number four, Richard Lockhead. Can I ask the First Minister if she will provide an update on progress towards tackling excessive parcel delivery surcharges affecting many parts of Scotland? First Minister. Well, I recognise the long-standing concerns about parcel deliveries to our rural areas and very much appreciate the work undertaken by Richard Lockhead and organisations like Citizens Advice and Highland Council. Uh, this government has uh, worked with them and others on this issue, uh, and this has included the development of a statement of principles for fair delivery charges, which was subsequently adopted by the UK government. Uh, the business minister will host a meeting on the 27th of June with parcel delivery companies, retailers, consumer groups and others to discuss what further action we can take. Uh, I will uh, give an assurance to Richard Lockhead that we will continue to do everything we can. However, I would remind the Chamber that the regulation of prices for parcel deliveries is reserved to Westminster and it is time that the UK Government also took serious action to address this issue. <clears throat> Richard Lockhead. Can I thank the First Minister for her answer and also the news about the ministerial meeting that's going to take place and can I tell her that I continue to be inundated with cases of unjustifiable excessive parcel delivery surcharges imposed in homes and businesses in Murray and throughout Scotland by some companies when others deliver free or for a modest charge. And can I just say this is also not just a rural issue that a uh, main, main, uh, major online retailer Wayfair for instance imposed surcharges for some items on Falkirk, Greenock, Dundee, Paisley and other places, but offer free delivery to places like Penzance in the south of England. And whilst it's welcome that the online platforms like eBay and Amazon, who have met, recognise there's a problem and want to help it sort it out, and also the Advertising Standards Authority are now dealing with companies who promise free delivery to mainland UK, but then exclude parts of mainland Scotland. Uh, can I also ask if the First Minister is aware that many retailers continue to apply an additional charge after transactions as well, which is absolutely illegal, and also other companies just refuse yeah. to deliver Hurry to up, parts Mr. of Scotland. Lockhead. So given that the, the case for regulation that the First Minister mentions is getting stronger and stronger, will she personally intervene and take this up with the UK government so we can scrap that £36 million, million pounds surcharge in Scotland? First Minister. Well, well, firstly, can I thank Richard Lockhead? He has done absolutely sterling work on this issue. And both raised the awareness of it uh, at government level but also uh, I think contributed to some of the actions we're now being uh, we're now seeing it being taken to address this issue it is an issue that mainly affects rural issues but I think we've just had a timely reminder from Richard Lockhead that it's not only rural issues in Scotland that are affected by unfair and excessive uh, delivery charges it's something that's got to end um, and we're determined in the Scottish Government that we will play our part in ensuring that that happens and I will uh, give Richard Lockhead the assurance that we uh, we'll take it up again with the UK government because meaningful change will only happen if the government uh, that holds the main uh, levers and responsibilities here takes a far more active uh, role. We've made many representations 
in the past and we will continue uh, to do so. The UK government should be insisting that all consumers, whatever their base, whether in uh, rural communities or major cities, receive fair, transparent and timely delivery of their parcels. I think people everywhere in Scotland have a right to expect that. Supplementary, Jenny Mara. Presiding officer, legal parcels are being delivered by companies to households all over Scotland containing illegal drugs, including street Valium selling at 20 pence a tablet. What powers does the First Minister have at her disposal to stop legal delivery of illegal substances? Well, First Minister. That, that's an important issue. Obviously, uh, the, the member is raising uh, the issue of illegal substances. We often have uh, issues of uh, delivery of other goods that can be uh, damaging or used in a damaging way. I will uh, ensure that uh, a letter goes to the member setting out exactly what powers the Scottish Government has and where we may again have to look to the UK Government to take action. For example, I know there is uh, currently consideration of legislation to deal with the issue of, of, of knives and, and that includes parcel uh, deliveries as well. So if it's acceptable to the member, uh, I'll make sure that that information is provided to her so that we can make sure we're doing everything we can to address what I recognise is a serious issue. Question number five, Rachel Hamilton. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government will take to reduce the number of cancelled NHS operations. First Minister. We continue to support health boards to keep all cancellations to a minimum through better scheduling and planning of elective care. In 2017-18, on average, 830 operations were carried out each day, and this compares with around 22 cancelled for capacity or non-clinical reasons. NHS uh, Scotland staff numbers under this government are at a record high uh, and we've also committed to an additional uh, 2,600 nursing and midwifery training places and additional medical training places over this parliament as well. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the First Minister for that answer, but this year NHS Borders has consistently had the highest or second highest rate of cancelled operations due to capacity or non-clinical reasons. After one of my constituents had her operation cancelled, the Cabinet Secretary for Health wrote to me calling it, quote, highly regrettable and totally unacceptable, but her operation was cancelled again, and the Cabinet Sec Secretary wrote again and again said it was unacceptable. When will the First Minister realise that we need action and simply repeating bland statements of regret and saying it shouldn't happen just isn't good enough? First Minister. I uh, would never uh, diminish the importance of any uh, patient who has their operation cancelled uh, for a non-clinical reason. Uh, but I do think it's also important, as I did in my original answer, to, to point out the fact uh, that that will be a very, very small percentage of the total number of operations that take place each and every day in our health service. We are uh, working with health boards and will continue uh, to do that uh, to reduce the number of cancellations and to reduce weights. The Scottish Access Collaborative, for example, the development of uh, the modern outpatient service, these uh, are all initiatives that are about improving the position uh, and we'll continue to work on them. Of course, in, uh, particularly in March of this year, we saw an increase in cancelled operations, particularly down to the very adverse weather uh, that we had faced in, in many health boards uh, more than half of all cancellations for non-clinical reasons were down to the weather. Uh, but we will continue to remain focused on ensuring that the number of operations that are uh, cancelled for reasons that are not clinical are kept at an absolute minimum. Question number six, Lewis MacDonald. Ask the First Minister what impact the EDF energy announcement on the acquisition of the Nearsh Nagai project will have on renewables jobs and the supply chain in Scotland. First Minister. Uh, well, we welcome the purchase of the NNG pro project by EDF Energy Renewables. Uh, in August 2017, just to give some context of this, the Fraser of Allender Institute estimated that this project would contribute 0.6% uh, of GDP, which is about £827 million to the Scottish economy over its lifetime. It also predicted that the project will create thousands of jobs during the construction phase 
and over 230 operations and maintenance jobs for the 25-year lifetime of the wind farm. Uh, as I mentioned, I think, in the Chamber last week, uh, I met with the Chief Executive Officers of EDF Energy and EDF Renewables last Thursday afternoon. Uh, they committed to meet with the Energy Minister as soon as possible to discuss their plans for the project. Uh, I raised with them then, and this further meeting will provide uh, a further opportunity to seek assurances on how the Scottish supply chain will benefit from this acquisition. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much, and I share the First Minister's welcome for this project. I'm looking forward to, hear, look forward to hearing more from the Energy Minister in due course. But does the uh, First Minister also agree that support for training will be vital if workers such as those in BIFAB are to take full advantage of such opportunities going forward? And if so, what training support will her government's agencies provide so as to ensure a future for the yards in Methyl and Stornoway? as well as for the yard in Burnt Island. First Minister. Uh, yes, I do uh, believe that training is very important in terms of the future of this industry and our agencies. Skills Development Scotland, Scottish Enterprise already uh, focus uh, very much on that. Indeed, one of the particular things we focused on during the oil and gas downturn uh, was uh, a training initiative that I think Lewis MacDonald welcomed at the time that helped uh, people working in that sector retrain for other sectors, including uh, renewable energy. Uh, Lewis MacDonald mentions uh, BIFAB. Uh, this is one of the contracts that, uh, while there are no guarantees, I think gives uh, grounds for optimism for the future uh, of a company like BIFAB. As uh, the Chamber knows, we are very focused on ensuring that we do everything we can to support BIFAB. When the acquisition by DF Barnes was announced, it was made very clear that it was not a magic solution and that hard times still uh, lay ahead. Uh, the Yard has to win contracts, uh, but that acquisition means that BIFAB did not close, uh, and what we now need to do is support it to win contracts from projects like this to ensure that it has the bright future that all of us want to see. Supplementary from Graham Day. Presiding officer, thank you. In uh, July 2016, Brian Wilson, the former Labour Energy Minister, told the BBC offshore wind in Scotland is pretty much dead. Does the First Minister share my view that Brian Wilson has been proved wrong again? And will she join me in calling for everyone who wants to see the creation of valuable jobs in Scotland, uh, in Scottish engineering, and to fight climate change to get behind the development of all the offshore wind farms in the Forth and Tay, given the enormous potential they have in both regards? First Minister. Well, I agree very strongly uh, with that. We've seen massive reductions in the cost of offshore wind uh, in recent times, and there is huge potential uh, for Scotland in that area. The Forth and Tay projects have a combined economic value in excess of £6 billion, which in turn present some real opportunities for the Scottish supply chain. Uh, so while the placing of contracts is always a commercial decision for developers, collectively our aim is to secure as much work as possible for Scotland and to help achieve that we will combine our efforts and those of our enterprise uh, and skills agencies in making sure that we're doing exactly uh, that but offshore wind undoubtedly is a massive opportunity for Scotland and uh, I think many of those uh, who predicted otherwise have indeed been proved uh, very wrong. That concludes First Minister's question time. I will move on to members' business. May I ask those who are leaving the chamber to do so quickly and quietly, please? <laughs>